Yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, um, I think the Brechtian pedagogical gesture is quite appropriate um, when we talk about this project, if only for the fact that both Holly and I um, take really seriously the idea of kind of doing what we say. It, it, a big part of the work is that the subject material that we choose to look at is kind of somehow embodied or expressed in the work. So a common example of that, right, is on this last record, um, we were interested in exploring machine learning. And so as a result, we actually, you know, built a machine learning system um, so as to better kind of understand what's, what is interesting there. Um, and similarly, on the last record platform, the, the one prior, um, we were looking at, you know, ideas of surveillance and kind of platform economies. Um, and so as a result, we, you know, uh, figured out technical systems to survey ourselves and um, use those in the music. And also, kind of in parallel, I was working on my own kind of platform, um, the, the, the Saga project. Um, and so you can say to some extent that the gesture of, um, you know, since, since Platform, Holly's been really upfront, trying to render the practice somewhat transparent. Um, you know, my involvement, the involvement of others, building in kind of attribution and accreditation. Um, and, and, it, and it is, in a sense, uh, a, a, an artistic gesture to do that, um, simply because when you start looking at, um, you know, the way that the music industry works, for example, or, or many of these kind of technical systems work that we spend time looking at, um, accreditation, attribution, provenance um, is is almost always glossed over in favor of some kind of like individualist uh, mythology. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it, on top of that, you can see naturally because of Holly's interest in Haraway and the kind of cyborg um, lore, um, I think it's it's pretty appropriate to also suggest that that um, being kind of transparent or having kind of all of these different uh, people and kind of mechanisms represented under her name does represent some kind of an extension of the self. Um, I think what's kind of interesting about it, in a sense, is that you know Holly is not unique in the number of collaborators that she works with. Um, Holly, however, is unique in the amount of attention she brings to that uh, uh, component. So, uh, uh, and on, on the other side, there's also a, a bunch of, a, a kind of practicality to this, um, which is that for better or worse, you know, living in kind of a, a, a late capitalist individualist kind of economy, um, uh, you, in parallel to all of the very interesting things that you might be pursuing, um, there's also this cold, hard reality um, reflected back to you, which is, you know, uh, what perhaps um, the vast majority of people who might encounter your artwork perceive. Um, and in, in, in the music industry, at least, you know, Holly started this project literally making uh, work for a very small group of people um, privately in in a really shitty studio in Oakland um, and that's what you kind of become known for and known as you know and so for want of a better term the kind of brand of a project is is something that once it kind of gets gets going and, and kind of develops its own momentum the the costs of kind of diluting that um, far outweigh the benefits. And we, you know, Holly and I are married. We, we work together every day. We've kind of weighed, like had this conversation a million times of like, well, you know, would it be better if we did it under a different name or, you know, had a 
you know, Holly and I also work on a bunch of art projects together, or kind of more expanded projects. And, and we're like, oh, well, we could call it studio. And we have all these cool studio names and like, do, you know, domain names that we've, that we've bought. And then at the end of it, we're like, no, it's just, it's just Holly and Matt, you know. And in some ways, at least like now for the live performances, um, one way to kind of tackle this um, has been to, you know, to, to just refer to it as like the Holly Hunter Ensemble. And so that ensemble, um, you know, we consider that ensemble to, of course, include us and also uh, and include all, all the wonderful musicians that have contributed to this, but uh, to this project. Um, but also, you know, uh, Jules Laplace has been our, our machine learning developer. Um, and so, yeah, so over time, as a kind of practicality, um, uh, we, we're having to work with or, or kind of be um, uh, be pragmatic with uh, uh, the uh, the lay of the land, and the and the lay of the land is is one in which it's much easier for people to grok or to immediately recognize um, a lone artist versus this kind of more abstract uh, group of group of collaborators. So to speak to the Lewis Hamilton example, I mean, I guess my perspective would be that it, it perhaps takes the best driver to be trusted with the best car. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of the culture industry is, is kind of about trust in that way, right? Like anyone operating at a certain level has great assistance, um, but, but they also have to perform to the level that, such support warrants um so only occasionally do you see cases where for example the support given to someone is so mismatched with their personal capacities that it ends up you know looking bad for the whole production um so where we are really is you know rather than being concerned about collaborators involvement somehow acting to the detriment of the project um we instead choose to celebrate it um, and render the rather complicated and intricate processes of making work at the level that we do um, somewhat transparent. Um, and, you know, and, and fundamentally, Holly, I guess, like Lewis, um, is kind of the indivisible component in, in all of this. So, you know, irrespective how much different people uh, contribute to this project, um, if you take Holly out of it, uh, there's there's not a lot there, uh, so you know it's a it it, it it's a, it's an interesting one, and 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 as I say, it, it's worth having the conversation just because through having this conversation, actually, you can learn a great deal about how the culture industry works, and uh, and how these kind of as you you know the, these kind of cyborgian or uh, institutions are are, are formed. Um, but to go back to the earlier point. The, the only thing unique about uh, what we do at this level is that we talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you like Frontier. It's, it's definitely one of one of the favorites it was kind of like one of the aha moments on the record um i mean it, it, yeah it, it's interesting to think of like um you know we we approached kind of these hybrid vocal reference points from somewhere that i think is is actually quite uh quite interesting in in so much as um looking at kind of the universal genesis point of those vocal traditions and so on frontier you'll hear um sacred harp tradition there's also a lot of um medieval vocal writing in there um something that yeah some harmonies that that one might um just as easily recognize in bulgaria as one would in um indonesia and that's kind of the point across the whole record actually is We've been looking at, um, for example, Gary Tomlinson, who, who published that beautiful book, A, a Million Years of, of Music, um, looking at kind of the, the, the evolutionary um, function of music. And also someone who is 
a little less well known, but but fascinating. This guy Joseph uh, Jordania, who's a, 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 an Australian musicologist who studies vocal um, vocal traditions, um, and you know the the most interesting observation I think we kind of came to was, you know, there is clearly almost like a, a there was a, a, a pre-conscious function to uh, polyphonic singing um, in so much as it, um, there are numerous theories about this, but one of the kind of more beautiful theories is, is um, that this polyphonic vocal singing, in a sense, um, allowed us to coordinate across mountainous regions, great distances, um, and, and overcome um, uh, uh, predators, um, so as a as a hunting and defense mechanism, uh, polyphonic singing kind of uh, intervals of, of seconds um, allows the voice to travel um, really far further um, than it than it might normally do. And so, in essence, from that perspective, the the kind of more short term. Um, uh, uh, provenance of different singing traditions becomes less important and, and what becomes more important is maybe a shared uh, uh, human capacity for this kind of coordination um, and once you view it from that perspective um, it becomes really fun to actually uh, try and find you know a uh, uh, harmonious or in some cases dis like um, discordant um, uh, combinations of different vocal writing traditions jammed together in one place and frontier is kind of one of those you know speaking about the folk AI I mean the um, that was also something we were obviously thinking about because you know when you're you're dealing with machine learning systems and kind of like transnational corporations hoovering up um, data, uh, kind of indiscriminately, uh, n not being able to establish provenance. You, what you encounter is a, is also an incredible, um, and not not unproblematic, but an incredible kind of coordination, new coordination capacity that we have as a as a as a people. Um, and so, there is something kind of hopeful. At least the, the 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 underlying thesis, the way in which we've approached AI, is to say, well, okay, well. If this is indeed a new, um, a new means of, uh, of of coordinating um, with each other and and reaping the benefits of each other's uh, 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 labor, you know maybe we do need to start seeing this as kind of a, uh, you know, going back to kind of like the the species level, <laughs> um, and and you know not of course discounting the different kind of threads that have evolved over time. But instead, looking for, looking for the fundamental utility, and uh, and dreaming about uh, uh, dreaming about a, a unison, <laughs> um, rather rather than division. And musicology is a really um, is a really interesting uh, way to look at that. You know, there's been a number of musicologists, for example, uh, Jordania brings this up often. You know, talking about how, you know, uh, with these polyphonic singings. Um, you can go to um, islands off off Hawaii or in Polynesia and hear very very similar um, vocal singings that you might hear in in the mountains of of the Caucasus. Um, and these are peoples who would never have uh, interacted with one another beyond the, beyond the obvious observation, which is that they all come from the same root point right at some point we all left africa and <laughs> went went our different ways and and yeah so there's, there's something really really quite beautiful about those kind of shared vocal traditions and discovering how much more we uh how much we do actually share in in those developments um yeah and at the end of the day i mean like uh you know on a, another kind of practical level it's just this this beautiful um pot of of reference material to hope to to make some new combination and and ultimately you know we saw frontier as a bit of like a solar punk jam it's like very kind of optimistic um 
but at the same time, the intention was to to to, to jettison some ideas. I mean, in, in the lyrics, you have, uh, you know, don't listen to what the silver say; their world is long gone, right? Um, and yeah, the 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 Hodderin, uh, uh, uh quote that you mentioned that the you know where the danger is also grows the saving power is kind of you know uh you you could parallel that with 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 again another haraway right like uh stay with the trouble um that's very much you know that's that's very much the approach with the music is like okay there's there's a bunch of a bunch of stuff to be concerned about and in getting getting your hands dirty and entangled in trying to pull that stuff apart is the you know lies the actual lies one of many potential solutions um but not running toward that fire um is basically tantamount to uh to rolling over and we're not yet <laughs> at that at that point It's funny that you mentioned John Mass. I haven't thought about him for for some time, but but now that you do mention him, of course, I can definitely see uh, um, some uh, some parallels there. Uh, partic oh, particularly growing up uh, religious in the United States um, and, and then pursuing um, academia. I mean, it's funny he. One of the earliest shows um, Holly and I went to together um, when we when we first met was was John Mass at a venue called West Germany here in Berlin, and um, we had just been in Egypt for a while, and um, I'd been collecting uh, a bunch of tapes of Coptic uh, Christian music, and there was one particular tape. Um, the in anticipation of going to see John Mass in like a month or something, I was like, God, I gotta, I gotta get this tape for this guy, because um, I thought it actually sounded a little like him. It was there was something about the the recording and the smearing of the chords and and the voice was very deep. Um, and yeah, anyway, I, I, after the show, I gave him that tape and I said, Oh yeah, I, I, it just reminded me of you. Um, and he he in a very serious way seemed confused by the. <laughs> <laughs> confused by it i don't know if you ever um if you ever listened to it um at least to me even though i can see parallels there um i, I see these as being kind of like two distinct periods i think john mas in a sense was incredibly prophetic in so much as his was really a you know i see him as like a precursor to reddit or something and i hope that i hope that comes across well but um you know that this kind of this this combination of like um becoming fully absorbed um in this kind of uh acceleration um and kind of in the in the worst cases um there's there's like a maybe not the worst case but there's this kind of like a very dark humor um to his work um, that wouldn't feel out of place um, on internet forums of the past, you know, five or six years. Uh, at the same time, also a very deep melancholy um, and kind of like a, a like a passionate uh, um, yeah, like a, like a passionate. A, a immersion as you put it I, I think you know I, I have a lot of a lot of time a, a lot of time for his music and I do think it was very far ahead of its time um, and in a sense you know with the work Holly and I've been doing as much as we might appreciate that work I see it as being somewhat um, antagonizing to that to that period um, in the sense that you know around the making of platform for example we were very conscious of a kind of growing, you wouldn't quite call it irony, but just a kind of like an approach of like bathing in, bathing in the trouble 
Um, whereas our approach has, has been what, what, I, what we at least interpret as being a little bit more optimistic or, or uh, uh, in a sense, we're looking to, 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 to kind of engineer ways out of that while also acknowledging it, its, its power and seduction. Um, and I feel like John Mayes in a very different context actually was more kind of creating work that um, anticipated and kind of framed uh, 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 terms for like complete absorption into this like online abyss. <laughs> um, but he was making that work, you know, before, you know, I mean, pre, pre burial, you know, this kind of, deep melancholic music that that feels very native to like an internet forum um he was he was really uh far far ahead um in that in that respect and so i have i have a lot of respect uh for the work that he did i, I have to think about it some more though because i think that uh there is a shared liturgical kind of deeply emotional kind of uh rapturous kind of quality to 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 both the mute like both cases and yeah i'd have to think about that some more because it's actually it's an interesting comparison i think um you can you can at least like through making that comparison you can probably make some really interesting distinctions um but there's definitely a shared sensibility there and i, I and i'd imagine it is you know the, the the experience of someone growing up religious um uh logging on you know <laughs> Critique's really important as like a a starting point. I mean, at least for us, that's kind of, as I say, with even the, the approach to all the works, it's like we do a ton of critique in a sense, like a ton of research um, just to be able to establish our, our opinions on things. And a lot of that can get very negative, um, of course. <laughs> um, but then the the big kind of interesting question is how to not wallow in that negativity and produce something that, you know, like open a window. Um, and yeah, so in the, when I say something like music doesn't matter, I mean, I think to, to a large extent it, it, it doesn't. Um, to a large extent, the kind of mind share of musical discourse um, has been, you know, has been eroded significantly since I was, um, you know, in the, in the last 10 years or so, um, the amount of time and attention uh, people might pay to a musical work, the amount of potential it has to kind of uh, participate in, in uh, political conversations and so on, uh, in, in the last kind of 10, 15 years or whatever, the, the, the actual work itself has kind of, the influence of that has maybe subsided the formal qualities of the work has subsided in in favor of all of the stuff around the work, right? The the personalities um, and their interactions, um, the, uh, the 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 kind of the, the signaling mechanisms of the work have taken precedence over maybe the work itself, and that's why you end up in a scenario where you know many of the most famous musicians um, <laughs> at the moment, you know, most people you'd find just as many people who have who share an affinity with what they're, what they represent, rather than uh, you know any any of the formal characteristics of the work or, or or any formal progression that might be contained, contained within it, and that's just a. Um, but of course, like that's a that's a starting point. Like that observation is a starting point, um, and then the question is, well, if you have trained in music and you do care about it, um, what then to do with with that predicament? And so you know. Our formulation across the various projects is to say, well, we don't harbor any uh, unrealistic expectations as to the power of what this one song could accomplish. However, you know, what could this song carry with it? Um, how could this song be disseminated um, to make the desired uh, intervention? Um, and 
you know, whether that be um, through opting to, you know, work with all these kind of beautiful humans um, on stage and kind of force them into a more kind of fully automated uh, festival space or, um, you know, to have the, 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 the popular music kind of work as, as Holly says, this kind of uh, carrier signal for ideas and thoughts that never would get prime time, you know? I mean, I was joking with someone about this recently because, you know, in as much as we get people appreciating what we do, we also get in equal measure um, people who get rubbed the wrong way by what we do um, because it is a really difficult dance to to marry like a, a, a genuine interest in, in what's often quite nuanced research with, you know, to marry that and, and, and tether that to what's often a very unnuanced space of, of, you know, popular music journalism or, you know, big hulking uh, commercial music festivals. And my criteria to be able to assess if we're doing quite well or, or if, we're, if, we're, if we seem to be on the right side of that, that, uh, that politic is, you know, I'm like, well, you know, we have The Guardian writing about inhumanism related to proto. Um, and I'm like, that's a, that's a success. I'm like, I, I, like um, you know, we have in other areas, um, you know, a lot of my work, which, you know, for what, the past seven years, I've been deeply critical of the centralized web. Um, uh, and slowly but surely, the, those thoughts in combination with the efforts of others that I've kind of picked up in my picked up in, in, in my kind of shouting about this has formed what, what I see as almost like a nascent subculture of, um, of people in culture really um, uh, concerned about the impact of, of these platforms in both the aesthetic process and also the, the economies around, around, around culture, you know. And so you can't uh, decouple the role of criticism in that, but I think that maybe one new potential um, is, you know, previously uh, as a band or whatever, like the, there was all this emphasis on the work that you were doing and there was kind of more of an economy around around that music um, as a result of there being more money and more kind of mind share in, in greater discourse. Um, you know, your song um, might have carried with it more power, but but you know the 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 internet age and the social media age is as problematic as as a lot of it is it, through us emphasizing um or through us putting the research like on equal billing with a lot of the the music that we do and the critique and the ideas um we've also gathered a, a number of people who might previously have never encountered this kind of work um because we're not just a music thing and that's the thing is like Music doesn't matter in isolation, but music can matter as one weapon in an arsenal of of, of weapons. Um, and and when you when you start seeing it from that perspective, it, it starts becoming really really interesting. I think so. You know, on the topic of critique, for example, it's like yeah, like does criticism matter? Do people really read music magazines? No, they don't. Actually, I know I know for a fact that they don't really. Um, but so that does, in a sense, like existentially threaten. The role of the critic, but but of course a contemporary critic would understand that immediately, or would maybe make some mistakes and come to understand that the hard way, um, and then would say, well, I have all these tools, right? I have all these, I have the ability to see the world more clearly. What would be a more effective way uh, to to embody this critique? Um, you know, so so yeah, so music is dead. Long long live music, um, kind of deal, you know. <laughs> The Grimes thing was definitely like purely coincidental. I mean, it's funny because it's we both released on the same label for AD too, right? And no one, no one had given us a heads up. It's really, it's like um, you have these release schedules, and of course we know our release schedule, and she knows her um, release schedule. It, 
I wonder if slyly uh, the people at 4AD were like, okay, it's going to be AI week. We're going to have Grimes and Holly and, um, you know, and, and Grimes is all right. It, it, it's a different, um, it's a different conversation. She, she also has a, like, I mean, a, a very broad audience and a, and a very young audience and a very different audience. I kind of agree her approach definitely is in that kind of Leibach Rammstein uh, tradition. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas, Ours couldn't be more uh, different. Ours, I would argue, is maybe a more earnest um, approach toward things, maybe a bit, um, a bit more hopeful. And in a sense, I was kind of grateful for the, the two things to come out at the same time, if only to kind of uh, make really vivid that distinction. You know, which is which is not to say that it's not, it's not fun to to play with these topics in that kind of Leibachy kind of jokey. Uh, embracing way um but but i thought it was it was kind of an interesting it was an interesting cultural moment right like that um to see those two diff two very different approaches ours is very much one of like dealing with the topic as a as a material right like if we're gonna make music about ai we're gonna make music with ai and we're gonna figure out the the potentials and the and the problems um um with that and in essence, the, the beautiful thing about Godmother, which, I mean, the, the joke about Godmother is that, you know, it was like the most human labor intensive automated process ever because it took us forever to get the system to do something interesting. But, but in Godmother, what you're hearing is you're hearing the true state of, of AI and music, um, the, the nascent state, right? The, the baby state where, on the one hand, it's very raw sounding. It sounds, it sounds to me like some of the earliest recordings. It's, it's this very rough, hissy uh, thing where you have to you have to pay attention to to to, to hear the, the the nuances there. Um, and and on the other hand, you hear this this kind of great potential in a sense where, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, we've been playing the first ever recorded sound that the Edward Lund, uh, Leon Scott de, de Martinville, like the the um, the first recorded sound that interestingly he never heard because he, he didn't have a, he had a way to record it but he didn't have a way to play it back um, we've been playing it alongside some of the neural network experiments we've been doing and saying well yeah like in this you can hear this wild potential because um, uh, if you think think back to these earliest recordings and you think to this kind of fidelity that we listen to music today we'd we'd invite you to 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 share that same imagination about these 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 early experiments, um, and of course, and you also hear life in there, and of course, it's not um, it's not sentient life, um, but it but it does ask or invite some really interesting questions related to that because it, it mimics sentient sentience relatively well, right? That the spawn system um, was trained on Holly's voice over you know many many hours. Um, and ultimately was making decisions on our behalf. Um, you know, we were feeding um, some of uh, Jalen's compositions to, to this machine learning system and Spawn was determining how best to perform as Holly. Um, and the, you know, the, the product of it is something that's quite like monstrous and strange. And, and also, you know, Holly would never be caught dead beatboxing. Um, but, but yeah, but there's something very honest and transparent again about about putting that out, particularly at, at that time when people hadn't heard new music for a long time and were probably expecting something far more polished. <laughs> yeah, so so it was it was really good timing and a really nice kind of kind of framing um, for those two things to come out of you know two perspective two perspective futures. One of which you know is is I, I believe a little um, you know it's my opinion I, I find it a little kitsch. Um, very well quantified, right? This narrative of like some omniscient AI uh, enslaving everybody, um, and then the other alternative being, you know, a bunch, of, you know, playing around with neural networks and and creating this like brash, nascent burst of sound that that in, to to me at least is is so full of potential. It, it's such an unwritten. It's it's a story with an unwritten end, um, and as such, you can't. Um, it, it's far more difficult to kind of uh, caricature it, um, at least at least at least for me.
but there's there's rooms for there's there's room for all kind of uh, perspectives on this, and and I have to credit you know uh, 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 Grimes for at least succeeding in in being contemporary with 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 the subject matter. You know, I'd I'd, I'd way rather listen to a Grimes record than like ninety nine point nine percent of other records that are stuck in a a, a really outmoded conversation. Um, I have to say I'm 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 really impressed. You're you're. This is probably the only time uh, for a while that um, anyone's made reference to Carr and particularly made reference to to uh, uh, that. What I think is a very special part of Carr, in which weirdly my my ex um, my ex workmate at, at Craigslist page recorded that voiceover so well. Um, and yeah, and Carr in itself was definitely a very kind of Ballardy and also a kind of in conversation with like uh, uh, Paul Virilia, right? Like the, 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 um, the idea of the train wreck or the, or, or, or the car crash. Um, yeah. I mean, we've, we've had, we've had a number of different engagements with cars. The, the, the electric car project is uh, many, many years ago. Um, we were approached by some wonderful people at this kind of Swedish, kind of like a design research company who, um, uh, they basically do research and development on concepts that they then sell to major, oftentimes, car companies. And so, yeah, we were kind of tasked in a small group. It was Holly and I and, and this um, these guys, James and Fernando, tasked to think about the, the, the challenge of um, electric cars being so quiet. Um, and the proposal was that, you know, we're going to need to come up as a society. We have to come up with car sounds, and, and at the time, all the major car companies were were basically replicating the sound of the combustion engine. Um, and of course, the the whole reason for us doing the project was us being like, "Well, that's really very boring. Like, you could you could uh, you could do so much more with this." So, long story short, we worked for about a year on the project, um, ultimately designing a. Um, a system, kind of an intelligent uh, sound system for for the cars that involved internal audio internal to the car and audio external to the car, and an interplay between between the two, in which the car would um, would signal to people around around it um, uh, its its intentions, um, and also there was the ability for um, the system to interact with other cars around it. So. You know, rather than envisaging a future in which you can customize the sounds of your car and you have this cacophony of different kind of disharmonious uh, cars driving on the street, rather um, having the car sounds kind of come together in in polyphony. Um, and anyway, the, the the you know we we presented that at like the Frankfurt Car Show, and uh, we actually ended up having it built into a car. It was installed into a car as a as a demo. I have some video online of of somebody driving it. Um, and we at the time had a bunch of meetings with um, people at car companies who were like, "This is really cool, but it would be super expensive, and we're not sure." You know. Um, and eventually, I think the European Commission on this topic that there was a dossier handed to them on this particular issue, and our project was page one. Um, in that dossier, and we were, you know, quite quite proud of it. Um, and so, in the in the intervening years, we hadn't forgotten about it, but you know, got busy and different stuff happened. And then, <laughs> uh, it, it, on two separate occasions in the last two years, I've seen major car companies um, come out with basically a very diluted version of exactly what we uh, designed. Yeah, so it was, it was, we're actually we're actually. On a very quiet level, trying to pursue that and be like, well, where do we stand on this? Because I think we, I think, all in all, for the project, we made like a thousand bucks for a year. It was, it was like not a very lavish, um, lavish thing. And now, you know, I was like, it, it's kind of this this incredible education um, in how culture works in a sense. Is you know um, that you can have a small group of people having an idea that that is maybe a decade. Uh, too advanced for the where the economy is currently, and then 
you know, six or seven years later, you see your idea reflected back to you by, you know, a major company promoting it at like some great, like super cheesy car show with like body popping, like dancers, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah. And, and when I saw, you know, when I, I saw that about six months ago, I was like, damn, yeah, this is a, I'm, I'm fairly sure we had a, we played a significant role in that, but I don't know whether it ever come back to us. Um, so yeah, I mean, cars, uh, yeah, like looking, obviously Holly's first, well, it wasn't her first release actually. She'd, she'd released under other, other names in the past, but uh, the first kind of gesture of, of this, this particular um, uh, project um, had to do with, with, with cars. We now, you know, have quietly uh, at least contributed to uh, to the sound of automated cars, and now, of course, we're um, we're thinking more generally about um, automation and uh, accreditation, um, which is, you know, uh, yeah. So it, it's funny that the whole thing has been, uh, yeah, like a bit of a um, a bit of an education and also affirming. <laughs> the reasons why we care about these things, you know, um, that oftentimes when it comes to uh, larger cultural products, you know, the, the genesis of those ideas is 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 very very poorly attributed. So you get a lot of, you know, not to not to sound arrogant or something, but you get a lot of people who were thinking in visionary ways, um, who by the end of it were just a bit ahead of their time, or you know weren't in um the best position personally or professionally to um to take credit um for for what they've done but hey that's uh that won't be news to anyone in uh in this room i'd imagine so How geopolitical is sand? Damn, that's a uh, it's a big question. Um, I don't know if I have a if I have a a, a tight answer to that. I mean, the, the one thing I, this is this is me just really me just me talking. I mean, the one thing I would say is I'm actually somehow less interested in kind of theorizing about. Um, how important sound is and in fact more interested in kind of disenthralling ourselves um uh with with sound as this discrete kind of element um if only because i you know obviously i have my own kind of academic entanglements and you know uh and read you know have, have spent about half my life now reading very you know uh smart um, analyses on on musical works talking about their you know the power of noise and the the the, the transgressive potential of the album and all this kind of stuff and I, and I um, almost not trying to just be a shit stirrer but but it's like I've actually increasingly found it more useful to to challenge that assumption um, and to say you know what if it what if there isn't that much of a geopolitical um, uh, uh, dimension to, to sound beyond, you know, the really, really isolated examples. You look at the work of someone like Lawrence Abel Hamdan, where he specifically um, finds cases in which um, audio, you know, uh, has legal repercussions or so on. Um, but there's this kind of, yeah, in a way, like the most romantic thing for me, speaking as myself, you know, um uh is more to just challenge um or or question those assumptions as a given and then think where what you can build on uh uh from that you know like it it, it the, for example I, I i was invited to a um to a kind of think tank that some wing of the german government was thinking about some impending legislation um to do with copyright and uh I was invited to, you know, say my piece and and and, and um, 
talk about stuff. And I met, there was an incredible um, musicologist there called Lee Marshall um, from the University of Bristol in the UK. And he had a really interesting um, approach, I thought, because his his discussion um, was pretty much talking about, you know, the social value of music. And his point, ultimately, really, to, to re relay it reductively, was um, that actually people care less about music than we've ever kind of... Uh, conceded to ourselves that you know i'm botching the statistics but something along the lines of like 40 percent of vinyl ever purchased um was never opened um things like that where and and, and afterwards he apologized to me because obviously being kind of the, the musician in the room or one of them um he was like i'm sorry i don't want to you know i don't know don't want to undermine your, your your value and i was like well no thank you actually because what you're saying to me is is something that I intuited, but maybe didn't have the statistics to back up, which is that ultimately, you know, the um, perhaps the greatest product of the music industry was the mythology of, of the power of the music industry itself, right? And you see this now where, you know, I mean, a lot of them are dying sadly, but you know, the, there's so much more value in the kind of folkloric uh, uh, stories about the transformative and unifying power of, of of pop music. There's there's more value in those stories than there actually is in pop music, right? Which is why when you go to the cinema, you can go see a you know a film about the Beatles or about Elton John or about Queen or whatever. Um, and so, it, which is of course not to say that there that there isn't some beautiful innate kind of possibilities dealing with in the realm of sound, um, but to play devil's advocate. I prefer that analysis now. That analysis now, to me, feels more fresh, and 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 also um, to use the staying with the trouble uh, analogy that 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 somehow in in kind of um, de-romanticizing and, uh, uh, and and attempting to be a bit more sober about these things, we might actually have some ideas as to. Um, how to reinstate music and the ritual of music and the ritual of congregation back in the political sphere. And so I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I've been doing research in the last year or so on clubs. Um, I won't go into why, but, but basically, um, you know, I, I've never had a particularly romantic relationship with club music. I didn't grow up in a time or a location where, um, you know, the, the, the halcyon days of big, techno or acid house or whatever it might be um and so my read on these things is it, i think fairly sober and, and when i look at um clubs ultimately i've been trying to approach them from a very cold kind of economic perspective saying well look you know clubs are powerful because real estate is powerful um, and the people who own real estate can set economic agendas and they can set them for long periods of time, abstract periods of time, right? There's a reason why, um, you know, people in Berlin are still listening to, to a techno music that's decades and decades and decades old. And it's because the people who own the space um, kind of determine that. And the, the space, in a way, determines that. The space, the, you know, the real estate um, was built for that explicit purpose. And so, again, through somehow distance rolling myself of this history and, you know, like, this kind of like never ending kind of uh, interminable nostalgia and romance around club culture and, you know, uh, peace, love, unity, respect, all this kind of stuff. Um, through being a bit skeptical of that, um, I think I've actually stumbled across something quite interesting, which is, you know, well, what would a different club look like? Um, um, particularly a club that was encoded with a protocol that, that refreshed itself. Um, and that, that, that also tried to maybe create more of a bridge between online communities and um, IRL communities. Um, you know, what, what would a club for the next century look like? Um, and what might the aesthetic and political outcomes of that be? You know, and that, as I say, that has very little to do with sound, but thinking about those protocols and thinking about those kind of interventions, I have no doubt would produce um, another geopolitical dimension to the sounds that come from those spaces. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, that's the closest thing I have to an answer toward that is that I, I give a cheeky eye roll when I hear another person talk about, you know, reference what's his face is a, a noise and, you know, the sand of a city is, you know, predicts the future. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I mean that's cool. But, but more often than not, I don't think it's the sand itself that does that. It's kind of like the, the context from which the sand um, comes. And I'm more interested in those kind of material, infrastructural, economic uh, coordination uh, components um, because ultimately I think that's where um, change comes from and that's where you know the space is created for, for sand to reinstate itself as something of importance again um, yeah so that's a, it's a very very long winded I hope uh, I hope that yeah I hope that helps <laughs> yeah so uh, thank you everyone um, to those who, who listen and 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 thanks guys for for being so thoughtful in your questions i hope uh um yeah i hope i i did all right um and uh yeah d i hope we can um come and join you all um in the future there's a lot there's a lot in the works and uh yeah i look forward to um consuming any documentation of this wonderful event um ex post facto so um yeah thanks for having me